Welcome to Digging In. I'm your host, Tasha Calvert, and I am so excited to welcome Corey Robertson and Sadie Huff to the podcast today. Welcome, ladies. Hi there. Thanks for having us. Yes, thanks. I love the live audience. This is so fun. It is so fun, and I'm glad you said that because for the listeners that are not here in the room, we do have a live audience. We're here at the Chosen Conference at Prestonwood Baptist Church, and this is a conference that is really centering around foster care and adoption and we're going to be talking about that, but I know y'all don't need much introduction, but I would like to just get to know you a little bit on a personal basis. Now, for those of you who may have walked in here and have not had access to any type of entertainment news or television for the last <laughs> decade, I want to let you know that I am so proud to have two women on the podcast that are really making a difference in the world. Corey, you are the co-owner of Tread Lively Productions. You're an actress. You're a mom. You're a grandmother, which I'm so excited to join that, that family soon. And um, you are just a leader and a speaker, an author, so many things um, in your own right. And then Sadie, you too. You are an actress and a mom, not a grandmother yet, way too young for that, wow. but you're also the founder of Low Sister, and y'all do conferences, and you've got a worship initiative lately, so that's kind of fun, too. I want you to tell us a little bit more about that, but these women are not just wonderful entrepreneurial women in the entertainment world. They are Christ followers, and they use and steward their platform and their voice to uh, build the kingdom. And so I'm just so very thankful to have you guys here to speak into all the things. But as we get to know you, I would just love to know some personal stuff, okay? Can we go? Can we dish a little? Go, girl. Well, <laughs> we did have a reality TV show, so it's kind of okay. like nothing's off limits. Okay, <laughs> okay. Okay, Sadie, I'm going to start with you. Can you tell us what it is like to travel with Corey? Does she have any weird idiosyncrasies? Oh, yeah. Traveling with mom is actually really fun. Me and my sister were talking about this the other day. Like, we would probably not be as adventurous as we are if it wasn't for our mom because she is so adventurous. Like, there's, like, a level of, like, oh, yeah, I'm adventurous, and there's, like, mom's level of adventure. And so, really? yeah, she's a lot of fun. I feel like she, you know, comes across, like, very, you know, businesswoman. Yeah, you know, <laughs> this woman is hilarious whenever it comes to travel. But some of the funny things mom does do in travel, like, yesterday we drove here from West Monroe, Louisiana. Shout out to the hometown. So we're driving. It. Okay, thank you. Let's okay. go. So there's always one, you know, there's always <laughs> one in every crowd. So um, we're driving here and we're like an hour away. And I'm like, okay, let's just get there. You know, mom's like, oh, I really want to stop at Dairy Queen. I really want to stop. I'm like, don't stop at Dairy Queen. We're an hour away. And next thing I know, she's pulling off. She's like, can I have a dipped cone, please? And then she's literally just sitting there eating her dipped cone. I'm like, I just love you. You're hilarious. Okay, let me just say, I've not had a dipped cone in years, but, like, there's so many signs from West Monroe to here for Dairy Queen signs, and they just got me. It was like every time I'd pass one, I'd be like, yeah, that looks really good. A dip cone from Dairy Queen. And finally, like, yeah, 45 minutes out, I'm like, I'm doing it. I'm getting I know, a dip I'm cone. like, we're almost there. <laughs> okay, you know they can double dip it. Do you ask them to double dip it? She did ask me that, but I didn't do it because I was like, I'm driving and eating. That could be really I mean, messy. That's fair. So I just went for one dip. Yeah, they are hard to eat, but it was, yeah, she's just a whole lot of fun to travel They're with. They're hard to eat, but I managed. You managed. managed. Driving. You got the yes. job done. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay, now you get your revenge. Sadie, it was probably good that you you were fairly charitable with your answer because now your mom has incentive to be charitable back. Yeah, just remember but that. But Corey, we're, I'm not going to box you in like that. So okay. if you if you want to tell some some dirt on her, what are you glad that high school Sadie has matured past? Are there any mm. traits that were, as they say, high the toxic Sadie. traits? Yikes! Probably a lot of things. High school Sadie was really fun. I have to say, I had I enjoyed parenting you as a high schooler. Middle school Sadie, now there was a few there was a few moments there. Um, that so was a very rough stage for me. Remember ladies. the Nike shorts that you really really wanted. So this is this is funny. We had a we had a deal with Under Armour at the time, and um and so we got like discounts off Under Armour. So like. Our kids were all out, decked out armor, where Nike shorts was like the whole thing at that time. And Sadie really wanted Nike shorts. I'm like, I'm not playing full price for Nike whenever I can get a discount on Under Armour. And that was like a major point of contention between Sadie and I. <laughs> I was very bothered by that. <laughs> but I will say, high school Sadie, one of the things that I've been surprised about her as an adult is she's a really good cook and she loves to cook. 
High school Sadie would not make a sandwich. Like, literally, she, if, like, there was not food provided for her, she was going out to eat. She loved to go out to eat. She would go, like, and it was not, like, she liked to eat. She liked a little fancy eater. But now, as a mom, she started cooking and is a great cook. And I would have never suspected it. I thought they were just going to eat out their whole life. That's, there is hope for everyone. Yes. Like, you know, there this really is, is a place of hope, guys. Welcome. It is. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Okay, now you've already gotten one shout out for Monroe, but you know, be neighbors to us, that Texans, we've got quite a bit of pride in our state. Am I right, Texans? Yes. Yes, we do. So I want to give you guys a chance to brag on, is it Louisiana? Is that how you say it? Because some people say Louisiana. Is that we say Louisiana? I don't know about that. Yeah, Louisiana. I, that's how I say it too. We say Louisiana, but we say yeah. Louisiana. Okay. I don't know. But okay. then, like North Louisiana, where we live, and South Louisiana have completely different accents. Okay. I can hardly understand people from South Louisiana. So which one is the Street. Cajun? South, South Louisiana. Okay, that's South. Yes. Okay, there then, it is. And Look, so like we so claim, this is an educational podcast. We like guys. totally claim like Cajun Louisiana, but like if you're from South Louisiana, you don't even let northern louisiana's claim cajun like we can't like put we can't say we're cajun because like we're not legit like you got to be from a certain okay there's like a line it's like the full-on north and south yeah it kind of is but we love 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 our state if you come to west monroe we will try to convince you to move there because we love it that much okay give it what are the what are the top five things about louisiana oh well i love louisiana i really do try to get people to move there like almost every day probably because i'm like you should move here it would be so fun um but here's the thing about it it's not that we have anything super exciting going on but I think that's what makes the people more fun because you have to get more creative with your fun and everyone's fun revolves around each other like dinners together and hanging out or just being outside like I just love the culture so much it's so much around family and hanging out and being outside and going on walks and just doing life together Um, and big meals we're big food people so like crawfish season is a whole thing the first year when I moved to Nashville I lived in Nashville for three years and I was like so sad to miss crawfish season because it's so fun. Like you're all around and, you know, it takes a long time to kind of peel the crawfish. So it's more just like, you know, you're having conversation, you're having fun together. And so I just think the people are really special and the way that people do life together. So I don't know if I could do like one, two, three, four, five, because it's not like we have the things. It's just the people that make it really awesome and the passion people have for making where we live better is very exciting to be a part of. Okay, I think you've sold some of us, right? Okay, and at the risk of sounding ignorant, when exactly is crawfish season? Okay, so crawfish season is a spring, so it's right now, and it is, it's a whole thing. There's crawfish trucks that pop up, like, on every street corner. Everyone's eating outside, and it's so much fun. We actually kind of, I think all of Louisianans eat kind of seasonally, so it's like, crawfish season and then summer is like fish catfish everyone's you know out fishing then the fall comes and everyone's deer hunting so you're like deer and duck Duck. and so that's a whole part of the culture of Louisiana and I just realized we've talked a lot about food so far so obviously it does it does revolve (laughs) around food in our state but it really is the people and I think the hospitality there are friends of ours who come down they're like Um, The cashier at CVS just prayed for me. I don't even know what to make of that. But it really is that way. You know, people, there's a lot of faith. Like uh, our first Ello Sister Conference, the mayor really wanted to come pray over the girls. And so she came and like prayed over them in the morning and just really welcomed them to where we live. And it's just, that's the heartbeat. Like they're very hospitable. And I think, you know, that's from leadership down. And it's really beautiful. So yeah, we could, you know, you're all going to learn a lot, hopefully more about adoption stuff. But I hope you learned a lot about Louisiana too. <laughs> <laughs> we love Texas. Y'all are great neighbors. So, that's yeah. right. great we neighbors. Yeah. We we and we love Louisiana. So that's that's awesome. Well, we do want to shift the conversation for why you guys are here. And I would just be curious. You know, my sister and I were talking. My sister has adopted, and we were talking about just the difference in the narratives of adoption and fostering. From Corey, we're probably similar ages when we were growing up versus Sadie, your generation. Corey, what is your first recollection? of adoption did you have a friend was this a character on tv tell us a little bit about that and was it positive or negative oh that's so interesting so um I grew up in a home that 
always, we had a spare bedroom that was always full with somebody. My family were very hospitable. My parents just always welcomed people into our home. So there were several, there were several single moms and their kids and their babies that lived with us. So I was kind of like a second mom to a lot of kids growing up that came into our home. So my family never adopted, but there was a conversation around that, but it was more of like just an open home for people who needed a place to live. Um, So I don't know if it was specifically about adoption. Now, of course, like anyone else, you probably saw a movie that where they made fun of someone for being adopted, and that always never sat well with me at all. Um, And then it was my senior year in high school that my Bible teacher, I went to a Christian school, and he adopted a little five-year-old boy, and he was the cutest little guy. And, um, And my teacher that year, I'm sure he talked about other things, but that is just all I remember was him talking about the, the responsibility of us as believers to take care of the fatherless, to take care of the orphan. And it struck me, and I knew that that was something I wanted to do from, from then. But I think it really was implanted in me in my childhood of seeing my, my parents just welcome people and other little kids. And I got to be like a second little mom at 12 to um, babies that lived in our home and things like that. That's such an encouragement for parents among us just to know the impact that we have and how we steward even our spare bedroom. I love that testimony. Sadie, it was probably a little different for you because y'all have adopted in your family of origin. Tell me about your first recollection of that subject. Yeah, so I think it was kind of what I always knew um, because I was five years old whenever we adopted Will. And I remember going down and like we went to Baton Rouge, that's where... We were able to get him, and I wore my big sister shirt, and it was, like, super exciting. And he was just, you know, my brother, and he always, there's just no difference, you know, for me um, with him than John Luke or my biological brother. And so, I don't know, I just never knew anything really different than adoption. And then Rebecca came and lived with us, and then Rowdy um, later on. And so, different ones, there was different reactions or different um, take on I guess maybe how adoption impacted or what I learned from adoption, but it's always been in my heart. And then I think for me, um, you know, I I know one day we want to adopt. I don't know what that'll look like, but one of my personal memories with adoption was when we were um, in Haiti. I was like 15, I think, and we had traveled abroad, different trips and stuff like that. We were in Haiti, and this little boy, he was found by the river, and so they were calling him Moses. His name is Millicene now. But um, he would, like, not look at anyone. He was very shy. He was, like, two or three at the time. And, you know, he just wouldn't look up at anybody. And then whenever I came up to him, he looked up at me, and he, like, reached for me and said, Mama. And I held him literally all day that day. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, I remember. Like, he yeah. would not go to anyone else. Yeah. He slept on me during church service. He was just, like, my little buddy. And then I just started noticing things about him. I was like, I think that something just feels off. Like, I want to check and see if there's something wrong. And turns out he did have, like, something wrong going on that we were able to find out from me just kind of noticing it in him. And I feel like that day I realized I definitely have a heart to be a mom to someone who is not like my biological child, you know, like the bond that we had that day. And so we've been able to sponsor him from afar and actually got to go back with Christian when we got married and meet, he got to meet him and they bonded on a whole nother level like bros because he's older now. They're playing sports all day. He has a little Polaroid picture of us. And so that's just been really special to me. And so I think like I've obviously been so impacted by my mom and dad adopting and them being my siblings, but I've had my own personal feel that like, okay, I'm going to do that one day because it feels like that's just in me, you know, which we're all called to that, whether you've had that experience or not. I think that's something that we're all called to. It's in all of us as believers. But when you get those personal experiences or you're personally sitting in a class and you're impacted by that or you're watching a movie, like for Christian, he didn't grow up in a home that had adopted siblings. But when we saw like instant family together, that was very impactful to him to see what that looks like. And then coming into our family and seeing the dynamics have been really impactful. So, you know, it can be anything that opens your eyes to that idea. But that was one for me. That's so beautiful. And, you know, I was just thinking about how we've been framing this conference. We've been framing it as an urgent summit on foster care and adoption. And, you know, when you go to someplace like Haiti 
and you have an experience like you just shared with us, Sadie, that feels so urgent. It feels so right in front of your face. And I think being here in America where we have so many systems that, um, that kind of keep foster and adoptive kids out of our view, we may be missing out on some of the urgency. Let me just ask you, do you feel like we're being dramatic to call the foster care and adoption crisis a crisis? Is that, are, are we being a little extra there? No, absolutely not. I mean, it is a crisis for any child to not have a family. And I remember um, uh, years ago, whenever we didn't set out to be like adoption advocates, we just adopted because we felt called to do that and then later whenever the show happened and everything happened people noticed and started asking us so we did this um actually we did it here in texas at texas motor speedway this thing called drive adoption and we had a lot of foster kids from the area come and um i'll never forget the lady there who was the the leader of the group she told me that a lot of these kids that were there are sleeping in in a um like in in places that they weren't, they weren't in with families. They were in sleeping at the office. They were setting up cots at the office because they didn't have enough families to take these teenagers into their homes. And so, like, that's a crisis. We shouldn't have that. Thinking about, you know, we're here in this, you know, yes, there are difficulties in America. There are hardships. But, you know, a lot of us do live with a lot of abundance. And we still have kids sleeping on cots in offices because we don't have enough homes for them to go into. So that's a crisis. Absolutely. How do you feel like, I'm sure we can all appreciate how adoption changes the child. Talk a little bit about how it shaped you as a mom and you as a sister. Well, I was thinking I was going to tell this a little bit earlier. Do you remember what you said whenever we first brought Will up to the school to your teacher? You probably don't. So Sadie's five years old, and she was so excited. We had just adopted Will. She was so excited to get to show him off, you know, like bring her brother to school day, you know. Show and tell. Exactly, to bring her brother to school day. So I came up for lunch, and I brought Will. We, Will was five weeks when we got him, so he was so tiny. And it was just a miraculous. The way he came into our family was 100% God. And so we had gone to Baton Rouge, and um, he was with a foster family and got him. And um, her teacher said to her, she, she was, you know, picking with her. She was like, oh, I'm going to take him home with me. And Sadie said, no, you can't. He's ours, but you can go to Baton Rouge and get one for yourself. <laughs> it was like, that's how it works, you know. And so it was just this whole thing. But I, was, I thought about, But like, for real. <laughs> but, but I thought about, like, she's, like, ministering to her teacher, yes. saying, like, actually, you know, you, you can, you can adopt as well, you know. So it's just this beautiful thing. But God, I feel like, you know, he has taught us so much as parents and dependence on him and, um, and loving people who are different than us. You know, we adopted Will when he was five weeks and then Rebecca came to our family when she was 16 and then Rowdy when he was 12. So all different stories. And that's what the church is. The church is, is described as a family. Like yes. we are meant to, we become one as a family. And what you go through is what I go through, and what I go through is what you go through, and it really matters. And so God has taught us so much about that, about us being adopted as sons and what that looks like and feels like and that unconditional love. And, um, yeah, I think yeah. those are a few of the things. I was going to say something very similar, too. It gives you an opportunity to really see what it's like to be a family with someone who's not related to you by blood, just like the family of Christ. Like, we call mm -hmm. each other brothers and sisters in Christ, and we're not blood-related, but by the blood, we're related as siblings in Christ. And sometimes it's hard to love people that are different than you. But yet that's your brother or that's your sister in Christ. And I think adoption has given us just an up-close view on what that looks like. Because my adopted siblings, like Rowdy and Will and Rebecca, was never officially adopted. Because she was like 18 by the time she really officially moved in with us. But she is my sister through and through. You get to just love people that are so different than you and see them truly as your brother and sister because they are that. Um, even though y'all are different and have different stories and backstories and personalities and all the different things. So it's so special to get the opportunity to see that in your own home. And I think it helps you, I think for me at least, personally it's helped me love people outside of our home like that, like truly seeing them as brother and sister, even though they might feel different, or even though we might have different backgrounds. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Do you feel like growing up in a home where you had adoption as part of your story helped you internalize and understand the gospel in a way that maybe you would not have otherwise? Like, were you able to connect those dots spiritually to what was going on in your home? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know that I would have 
thought that as a kid. Like, I wouldn't have gone, oh, this is what this is. Right. But now, as an adult, reading the scripture, and then I'm like, well, I got to see that. I got to see that played out. Like, God adopts us into his family through the blood of Jesus Christ. That is extremely powerful, that we are literally in the family. Because when I look at my adopted siblings, they're in the family. They're raised in our home, same last name, same roof, same opportunities, same story, same everything. And so, like, we are invited into that family. Same name, same roof, same house, same opportunity, same hope. Like it's extremely powerful. So yes, I do think it makes that come to life. You understand the gravity of that, the gift of that. You understand the um, just the beauty of that really a lot more, I think, whenever you got to experience and see, and see it up close and believe it because there's nothing else. Like you wouldn't doubt it. It just is what it is. They're siblings. You know, it's not like a stretch to believe. It just is what it is. And so then when you see that, it's not a stretch necessarily to believe I'm a child of God. I'm adopted into that family. And that's what this looks like. That's a word for somebody in here, I bet. That's, that's amazing. Corey, for those who are in the room, and actually we, we've kind of got a good mix in the room here of different ages and stages. For people that maybe are not going to ever be candidates to bring a child into their home for, you know, lots of different reasons. Maybe they're not even called that way. We're all called to take care of vulnerable populations. Can you coach us up on how to be a good support system for those who will be adopting and fostering and what that's looked like in your own family for people to walk alongside you? Yeah, I think that's so good. I think, um, yeah, it, I think we are all called to take care of children, but not necessarily, it's not gonna look the same in every home and in every family. And so, yes, I think just being that support, cheering one, the language, the language that you speak, I'll never forget, um, I, w- I went to an adoption, uh, kind of an adoption fundraiser thing, and there were a lot of birth moms there. And um, the lady who was the director there, she said to me, she was like, you know, we don't say you gave up your child for adoption. We say you chose adoption for your child. And just that language, I was like, that's so important. You know, the language, the way we speak about adoption, the way we care for for families who have children that are adopted, the way we we notice things. I remember noticing whenever um, we adopted Will, because he looked different than the rest of our kids, how many times people talk about like, oh, they have their daddy's dimples, or they have this, or they have that. And so just giving that little extra love. And our son, Will, was so sweet to other kids. I noticed, I would notice him kind of notice other kids who were adopted at church or at school. And I could, t- I would notice him just giving them a little extra attention or love. And their moms would tell me, and it just made my heart so proud. So yeah, just that a little extra. We also have done things like, um, supported, helped a home that, you know, that does things like take in beds or do the needs for foster families, because that's such an important gift that you can give to your community. Seek out those places that are doing that, that are helping foster families, because a lot of times it's just a matter of, oh, they need the bed or they need this because they need to get their home ready um, to have that space. And I love what you guys are doing here and just equipping and empowering and and educating, because a lot of it is just education. Talk about it. My Bible teacher, Mr. Matthews, talked talked about it to me and it changed our whole entire family you know we it made our family what it is today because he spoke about it um, to me when I was you know 17 year old high school student so talk about it amongst amongst your friends and amongst your people and you never know who is going to be like oh God is speaking to me directly and I'm going to do this You know, I'm so glad you said that because I would say that that is probably one of the identifiers between our generation and Sadie's generation. I do not remember having conversations about adoption or foster care very often, at least. It was not something that was just a part of the cultural narrative. Sadie, I feel like it's a little different in your generation. I mean, you guys, we've kind of got like the polar opposites in your generation. You've got the, you know, feelings or facts type of uh, of lane, and then you've got the homesteading and the sourdough bread and the back to basics, and so we've got, and I love it, I love it, I love it, but what do you think it's going to look like for your generation to pick up that command in James that says pure religion 
is taking care of widows and orphans. What do you think that language is looking like? It's so great. I love that. And that made me laugh because I just made my first sourdough. I saw that. Oh, my and gosh. I already planned to say it. I was like, this is perfect. I <laughs> am just thoroughly impressed by everyone out there making sourdough bread on a regular basis. Bravo. And if you have extra, send it to me because I don't know if that's my calling. But very good. However, I do think, I actually think, to your point on those things, a lot of that is inspired by what we see on social media. You know, I finally made sourdough bread because I had seen so many people make sourdough bread. I'm like, what in the world? If they can do it, I can do it. And then I'm like, okay, this is actually pretty hard, but this was amazing. But I think it's kind of the same thing, you know, on a much bigger scale with things like adoption. We have gotten to see the world, in a sense, you know, through social media. You get to see so many different families. And there are a lot of families social media influencers who have adopted and they show you that and I think our family is one of them you know that like we said with Doug Dynasty we didn't set up my parents didn't set out to be like you know um, to speak at adoption things they were probably the ones that definitely would have come to this and then chose to adopt and now they have a platform and they've used it and people have seen our family and many people have adopted because they've seen our family adopt and so I do think there is just power in just living like the church of God you know like actually taking on the commands of God, I think about um, whenever Jesus is speaking um, on the Mount, you know, he's speaking on the Mount of Beatitudes, and he just chooses his 12 disciples. He had just done that. And then it says that a large crowd gathers around him, and they're about to hear him speak. It says, but he turns to his disciples. And I don't know, this is, this is not backed up by my research. This is backed up by me reading the Bible. So, you know, take it for what it is. But I almost feel like, was he planning on talking to everyone that day, or was he really planning on giving his speech to the 12 to say, okay, now I chose you. This is what it's going to look like to follow me, you know? And then all these people were already following him, so he's like, okay, I'm going to speak this to everyone, but I'm going to turn to my disciples. This is what it's going to look like to follow me. And he gives this completely, like, countercultural message of, like, blessed are the uh, you know, the poor, blessed are the meat, blessed are all these. And then he's woe to the rich, all this stuff. And then he goes into like, hey, let's just go the extra mile for people. If someone slaps you on the cheek, turn the other one. If someone asks for your, you know, your coat, give them your shirt off your back. If someone says go a mile, go another mile. And he just calls you to the standard of living that's so pure and that's so lovely. And he's saying this to his disciples. And then he says, People say, Lord, Lord, you know, um, but then they don't listen to what I do. But I tell you, if you would just build your life on this foundation, it would be like a solid foundation. And the winds would come, but it would not it would not crumble, you know? And I think about that when it comes to just actually being a disciple of Christ, what it looks like for the church to actually respond to being a disciple, to follow the teaching of Jesus and take on these things like adoption and then show the world a different narrative, show the world what that looks like to invite people in and then people go, that's a beautiful way of living. You know, that's a beautiful way of doing things. You're helping the world become a better place and maybe they would step into it. Um, my mom actually got a text yesterday, and some of this I'll probably share on, on the stage too, but my mom got a text yesterday from an atheist friend of hers who always likes to send her these texts to kind of be like, oh, gotcha, you know, here's the <laughs> proof. And um, mom's so awesome because she loves it. She just hits him back with something better, you know, and so... He sends this thing, and he's like, you know, we couldn't be a, a Christian nation because if we were really a Christian nation founded under God, then this wouldn't happen, and this wouldn't happen, and this wouldn't be the case. And just coming here, I was thinking about that. Like, people might say, like, how could this be a Christian nation when we have all of these kids out there that we're not taking in, you know, that are fatherless and are orphans? And I just think, you know, to his point, it's actually interesting because he's kind of crediting Christianity that if we really live that way, then it would be a powerful thing. But it couldn't be because he's not seeing the fruit of that. But I'm like, what if we really did act like those disciples of Christ and took on those things that he's calling us to do, really obeyed and trusted that even though it's scary, it'll be solid ground, we'll be on a firm foundation and then the world would truly be a better place. You'd really be a city on a hill. You know, you'd really be that light of the world. So I took that kind of as a personal challenge. Like, you're saying, it's almost like you might believe if you saw the Christians actually act like Christ. You know what I mean? And so it's kind of a long-winded um, answer for the question. But um, that's just something I've been thinking about. I think that's a beautiful answer, and I've got to tell you, as somebody, you know, a generation or two, I don't know how they do generations, but I'm one or two ahead of you, um, I am so hopeful 
for, for your generation, for so many of y'all, for my kids. I am so hopeful. I mean, I've been watching uh, Jenny and JP going to these college campuses and baptizing thousands of people. And like, I am so hopeful for what is to come. And I think you're exactly right. I think you guys could change the world. And I think the rest of us, we're not done yet either. So I'm not saying we get a pass to sit back and watch, mm -hmm. but what a beautiful spirit to embrace that man, if we lived it, wouldn't, wouldn't it be different? I love that. Okay, Corey, I want to ask you a question because I know there are still some apprehensions. When you talk about bringing somebody into your home. I don't have that personal experience. My brother lived with me for a little bit. We took him in for a while, but he was somebody very familiar to me. Now, I have taken in two son-in-laws, and I will tell you, one of them is in the room, and everything went great until we got him on the ski slopes. <laughs> and uh, just That's kidding, Michael. Right just there. there. It was a, you know, you either grew up in that family or, but there's differences. There's things that you kind of don't know. There's some blind spots when you, when you bring in children and people that are not like you. What would you say to assuage the, the apprehensive parent out there that's saying, ah, I'm just a little nervous about this? Mm. Well, I don't know if this is going to like ease anybody's mind because it is hard. <laughs> it's not, isn't easy, you know, and right. I, but I don't think right. God has calls us to like an easy life. I don't think there's anywhere in scripture where it's like, you're going to become a Christian and your life's just going to be easy. And that's what I want for you. He does call us to an abundant life. Right. If that's different than calling us to just an easy life. And I think, um, you know, there is, there's, there's points in scripture is just, there's a lot about obedience, you know, it's that they're obedient to what God, the way God asks us to live. And that scripture in Matthew that just talks about whenever the day of judgment comes, he's going to separate you and say, like, you didn't, you didn't feed me. You didn't take care of me. You didn't clothe me. And, you know, that is, that's a defining, defining thing for us as a church. Like, that's what we are, we're supposed to be about. And so I'm not going to say that it's not, it's, it's easy because it's not, it is hard. There are hard things about it, particularly adopting older children. I think um, perhaps Willie and I thought we were doing pretty good as parents. We were like, you know, we got this figured out. We got, you know, five kids, we've adopted, we've done it. And then we adopted again. And we were like, whoa, we don't know anything. <laughs> we are, <laughs> we don't do not know what we were doing. And that's when the dependence on God fully sets in. And, um, and that's, that's, that's what it's about. You know, he doesn't promise us it'll be easy. But he promises he will be with us. He will yeah. carry us through. He will walk with us. And, you know, he will, he will guide us. We ask for wisdom. We ask for um, for strength. We ask for all those things, and so I think that it is something that you know you you have to decide that like oh, we're doing this because we want to be obedient to the life that God has for us. And yes, there are blessings that come from it. Just just like when you have yeah. children too, you know, my mom used to always say, "There's no guarantees with your own biological kids. Like they can screw up and <laughs> embarrass you and all those things." You know, so it's not having children in general. It's not, it's, it's a risk. You know, God took the risk when he created us. He knew we were going to screw up. He knew we were going to be hard. He knew we were going to make him sad sometimes because we were going to choose the wrong things. But just the same, he loved us and took that risk to create us. And that's what we do when we have children adopted or biological. I'll say too, um, even just back there, um, I was talking to a sweet new friend and she was saying, um, it's really good to hear from you as a sibling because so many people fear that, you know, for the siblings, it might disrupt the family. And I said, well, it kind of does, you know, <laughs> it does disrupt the family. Like it, it, it is hard, you know, but I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's just part of it. And I think that it's the same with, you know, Christ adopting us, like, it's a little disruptive, like we mess up, like it's, you know, it's a little shaky there for a minute while you're trying to figure out how to not live according to the flesh and live according to the spirit, like it's a hard process, and so I do think that I remember when we adopted um, the oldest, and um, at an older age, and I was just like, whoa, like just little things, like I remember he, um, he sat in my, like my seat, like we all had like our seats, you know. In the car? Is uh, no, that no, what you're at, at the dinner table. Oh, okay, it's, I was going to say, like, it's either the, the, the car, car or the dinner table. The car was a whole thing too. Yeah, yeah. the car, the car too. too. What yeah. is but that But the about? dinner that's table. That's another podcast. It's a thing. It's a and thing. And he sits in that seat, and I'm like, ooh, that's my seat. And he's like, <laughs> why do you have a seat? Like, why would you have a seat? And I'm like, 
because I have a seat, you know? <laughs> so it's just like the tension is there, but that's okay. You know, it's good. It's stretching. And so I don't think, you know, you'd never want to paint the picture like, adopt, it's so great and nothing will bad will happen. It'll be so sweet. Like, yes, it's great. It's beautiful. It's the heart of the Father, but it's definitely not easy. And so like on a way smaller scale, like sourdough bread, you look at it and it's going to be think it's easy. It's a hard process that you got to tend to, but beauty comes from it. And it always comes back to sourdough these days. I'm just saying. Um, Sadie, you've kind of already answered this question, but you've mentioned that you and Christian would like to adopt at some point. You don't know what that will look like. How are you preparing yourself for whatever that might look like? And how would you challenge somebody in here who maybe, you know, I don't, I would assume some of you don't really know if this is going to be on your life map or not. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's something you're considering because you're here. How would you speak into somebody who's saying, I don't know if I am or I'm not, but here's what I want to do to kind of get myself prepared for it. That's great. That's great. I think, you know, even, even speaking at something like this is intimidating to me because I'm like, man, I should be the one just listening to these conversations and learning because I'm in that process of, okay, God, prepare my heart for what that might look like one day. I want to learn more. I want to educate myself more. So it feels weird to give advice to something that we haven't stepped into yet. So I'm more so speaking from my experience with my parents than my own experience of adopting. But I think the biggest thing is if you give God an open heart, you know, you give God open hands and just a willing heart and say, God, you know, I know this is your heart, so put it on my heart, you know, and if, and if that's something I'm supposed to step into one day, then it's a yes before I know what that looks like, just because I'm saying yes to you, so my heart's open, and when you have an open heart, you know, you have conversations about it, you prepare yourself in just listening to people who have adopted, or maybe even, you know, you're more attentive to YouTube, people who have adopted, <laughs> and watch the videos, like, whatever it is, like, but if you don't open your heart to that, if you're not willing to it, you might not, you know, get that advice, you might not receive those things, your heart might not be fully open, and so Christian and I both, we just have very open hands, with it, open heart, a willingness. God, we would love this to be a part of our story, but we need you to make it known when that's supposed to be, um, or who that kid is, where that kid is, the timing of bringing the kid into our home. Um, and it's cool, because Christian and I just have conversations every now and then, just check-ins, like, all right, where are you at with that? Like, do you, yeah. do you feel ready for that yet? Do we not feel ready? Why? Why not? Um, one of the verses Christian and I always talk about with adoption, we actually have this at our house, um, like on a wooden thing, it says, we love because he first loved us. And that we always just say, like, hey, would our heart be that for someone that we were going to welcome into our family, that we will love them because we've first been loved? So because we've received adoption, would we be open to giving that an adoption? And so, again, that's not, like, a final answer. It's kind of a dot, dot, dot. It's, okay, God, when will this happen? Is this going to happen? What will that look like? And it'll be fun to see the story unfold. But I think, you know, if you can just give God a yes before you know all the details, that's what faith looks like. And that's just kind of where we're at. I think that's beautiful. And I think that's so wise for all of us in any type of thing mm -hmm. that we are praying through is just putting our yes on the table before the Lord and then asking him to prepare us because he will. Um, I have so enjoyed this conversation, and we're going to get to continue to have it. Corey, you have a breakout at 3 today, and then uh, Corey and Sadie are going to be back on the main stage. And so I would encourage you, if you want more detailed information, I know the breakout is going to go into a little more detail. But on this podcast, we always talk about where you're digging into Scripture. You know, so much of what you've just shared with us, Sadie, really speaks to kind of the heart of what we do on this podcast, which is we understand that in order for us to hear from the Lord, we've got to be familiar with his word. The Bible is the primary way that God speaks to us, and so we want to make sure that we are digging into God's word so that we hear from him, so that it shapes our, our worldview and it shapes how we think and interact with, uh, with everybody. So the final question is always, where are you guys digging into scripture and what's one thing you're learning right now? Corey, you go first. Well, I'm in 1 Corinthians right now. So I, um, yeah, just was like, I love just reading those, those words to the church and encouragement to the church and admonition to the church and all that and taking that to heart. But um, yeah, what is, what is he teaching me in it right now? I think it's, um, I guess I, I mentioned that earlier, like, 
every time I read the New Testament through again, I realize how much first love is just so overwhelming, the love of God. Now, I've read this book called um, You Are What You Love, and it talks about how, like, we're not just knowers, we're lovers. Like, we're drawn, like, we do the things because we, because we love, because we're, we're made from a God of love. He created us out of love, and so that's what we are first. That's what we're drawn to first. There's also, you know, so much in the scripture just about obedience, and I talked about that earlier, about, like, you know, like, and, and I, I liken it to in, within our family, with our kids, and I noticed that when we adopted a child who was older who hadn't really had that understanding, like, oh, a parent that loves you so much that what they have for you and what they're telling you is because as out of their love for you. And we have that with God. It's like he asks us, the things that he asks us of is because he knows us. He created us. He built us a certain way. And so what he asks us to do out of obedience is because that's what's for our best. And I just, um, you know, as I read scripture and every time I kind of like, okay, I'm going to read the New Testament again. I think that's one of the things that always really stands out to me. That's beautiful. I love that. Sadie, what about you? Yes, that's so good. Um, I've actually been studying. This has been a really fun thing to study. So if you need something fun to study, this is great. I've been studying when Jesus prayed, um, just like diving into that because I've been thinking about prayer a lot lately because I feel like challenged that I want to pray more and just be that person that people can really count on to be a prayer warrior because I have those people in my life and I'm like I want to be that for people you know and truly know how to pray and every time I thought of prayer I thought of you know Jesus teaching us how to pray our father who art in heaven and we know that but then I was like when did Jesus pray and there's so many times in scripture which is actually what led me to studying when Jesus chose his 12 and then the Sermon on the Mount, because right before that, it says, and he was up all night praying. And I was just like, wow, like before Jesus chose the 12 disciples, like before a huge decision, he was up all night praying. I just think about how many times, you know, you have a big decision to make the next day or a big thing you're about to step into. And that's when you pray. You know, you go to God, give me wisdom, give me discernment, help me. And Jesus was doing the same thing, you know. And then after an all-night prayer session, Jesus chooses 12 disciples and then preaches, like, the greatest sermon of all time. So you see just, like, the power and the overflow of prayer. But there's, like, 16 different places that I've just found through the Gospels that Jesus went to God just as human to a father. It's been really cool to dive into. I really love that, and I could not have, uh, you could not have known this, but we're actually going through the Gospel of Luke the entire year here at Prestonwood Women's Ministry. So we began in January, we're going all the way through, and we are going to be doing actually a whole series on prayer on the podcast coming up. So that that's, awesome. that's wonderful. So Sadie, you just set me up great. I have really appreciated this conversation. I've been encouraged by both of you in your faith, in your life, and your example, and just your vulnerability and willingness to share with us today. Thank you so very much for being here. And I'm so thankful that we're going to get to hear a little bit more from you today, those of us that are in the room. And we have really enjoyed having a live audience. This is not my typical experience in the podcast studio. So I really appreciate you guys being here and um, listening into this important conversation. And I'm going to ask for y'all help, y'all's help to close out the podcast today, how we always do, which was is telling our listeners listeners to keep digging in. It's worth it.